Good morning. It is wonderful to have you here in the house of the Lord today. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us on our first song.
Please be seated. Today we give thanks for a day in which we can gather together and give thanks to God and the beauty in the midst of this day. We recall all of God's gifts. Today, um, those of you that are joining us online, I want to welcome you. I'm Pastor Karen Hayden, and there is a way for you to connect with us, to register that you have seen this service called a Connect Card. It also gives information, uh, an opportunity for you to give information um, to us here at the church. Those of you that have joined us in the sanctuary, what a gift it is to see each of you. And there is a connect card with your bulletin. In your bulletin, you may see some of the events that are upcoming as well as future events. You may place your connect card in the offering plate as it comes around today. As we look ahead at some of the things that are happening in the church, I I stopped to name that today has kind of been four years in the making as we celebrate the ministry of Pastor Scott Bonds and his family with us. Today is Scott's last Sunday with us, remaining um, for another week or two um, in the area as they prepare to move to Illinois. After the service in our gathering lounge off of the main hallway, I invite you to stop by and give them the well wishes or memories or thoughts that you have for them. And we give thanks for um, cards and monetary gifts and good wishes that have already come in for this family. And those will be gathered and given to them following the service. Today, we have the opportunity to um, celebrate creation and all that we are a part of in that. Tonight, especially, we celebrate our pets and in the service of blessing of the animals at the Kingsway Pavilion at 5 o'clock. All pets are welcome. But if you have a pet that doesn't want to come and you want to bring a reminder of them, please do. And if you don't have a pet, you're welcome to join us. It's usually um, an informal time to sit and see each other's faces and celebrate the gift of our pets. Looking ahead at our Wednesday nights, this Wednesday night we will host a fall fest for children, teens, and families um, to join together after the dinner. There'll be inflatables, games, candy, and families are invited to a pumpkin patch. If you haven't seen it, our next door neighbors, the Presbyterian Church, New Covenant Presbyterian, um, have pumpkins for sale, but while you're here, um, all are invited to come in costume or not, but especially to bring a friend and join us as we celebrate fall. If you have any more questions, please see Lake and Dilday about that, our children's director. And then um, in the coming weeks, there are two new adult discipleship classes, a discussion with Adam Bodendike, uh, Director of Homelessness Services for the Community Partnership of the Ozarks. We'll be talking about the homelessness epidemic in our area. And the second class is a mini health mental series discussing managing stress and anxiety. And you can learn more about these um, by contacting our church office. Lastly, it is time for our annual food drive at Kingsway for the children of Wilder Elementary. We collect uh, food each fall for their backpack program of about 90 students. And um, for this month, we are collecting um, in our bins so that um, we can fill those throughout the year. Um, some of the items needed include applesauce cups, microwave popcorn, granola bars, peanut butter crackers, ramen noodles. There's a list of these things. It isn't a clean out your pantry and put them in a kid's backpack kind of thing. There are special things that we are looking for, and there are other places to donate other things too. I will name that. We certainly are thankful of your presence with us as we continue in worship in prayer today. Good morning, friends. Week. Try it again. Good morning, friends. It's my last Sunday. What are you going to do? Fire me? Let's go out with a bang, right? 
Now, it's so good to see each and every one of you. If you don't know who I am, my name is Pastor Scott Bonds, and we do come to the time in our service where we pray. Prayer is an important part of the life of the church. It's uh, one of the most foundational um, disciplines and practices we can engage in, whether it's individually, but especially corporately. And we do this because it's time we all come to this place uh, today with different things in our hearts, different things in our minds, as just as we come from different areas, right? We've got things going on, good and bad, come overflowing with joy, come with sadness and grief. But also things are happening in the world around us. So today as we come in prayer, right, we pray for all of the ways in which we come, but we pray today for our friends on the coast in Hurricane Ian. Um, I chuckle a little bit because I've been calling my son Hurricane Ian for a long time. Uh, destruction wherever he goes. Um, and at first it seemed like it was going to be a dud, but it's lived up to its name, his namesake. So, um, but I remember after Hurricane Katrina, six months after being there, uh, after, the hur- after the hurricane, traveling down to Kiln, Mississippi. And if you know anything about Hurricane Katrina, Kiln, Mississippi is where the eye of the storm came through. I remember going on a, a beach where the storm, the storm surge, 30 foot tall storm surge came in. And I remember see, not being able to go out into the water because uh, who knows what was in the sand still, right? I remember looking down the beach and seeing a casino lifted up off it, having been lifted up off its foundation and thrown into the sea, like a whole casino, friends. I remember multi-million dollar homes there on the coast, gone just some pillars, maybe some uh, cement foundation. I remember seeing tree lines just still six months later littered with brush and debris. Went back six months after that, a year after Katrina, and it was still death and destruction everywhere. People still without power, still without access to things. And so uh, my heart breaks for those that are dealing with this right now and the images that we see. And we know from Scripture we're supposed to care about our neighbors. And so today as we pray, we pray for safety, we pray for provision. And as we think about in just a moments from now where we receive our offering, we think of ways in which we can do more and accomplish more together than we can as individuals. But I do want to remind you that what came out in our newsletter this week as we pray, that UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, our uh, service and mission agency that goes all across the world, there is an opportunity to give there. And again, we can together do more as United Methodist uh, and as Kingsway United Methodist Church than what we can do as individuals. So if you join with me in praying. God, thank you for the gift of today, the gift that it is, to be able to join in this place with different things in our hearts and different things in our minds, overflowing with joy or struggling with grief, to be able to come, to be with one another, to hear your words proclaimed to us, to hear the good news, to receive your grace at the table, to just be in community to laugh and cry. So God, help us to encourage one another. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears. God, maybe our our eyes to see, hear, and taste that you are good, that you are worthy of praise. For our friends affected by Hurricane Ian, God, we pray that uh, your provision, your peace, your safety would be felt and experienced and that God, your people, would rise to the call to be your hands and your feet to serve, love, and minister to those in need. That together, whether through our prayers, through our giving, through our hands, that we might transform their world and our world for the better. So God, for all these things and more, we pray that your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Friends, I do just want to remind you one thing about our children's worship. We do have two distinct hours of children's worship at 9.15, 10.15. If you ever have any questions about that, reach out to Lakin, our children's director. Uh, but on top of that, now we come to our time of offering. And oftentimes we do this responsively to the sermon and closer to the end of the service. Uh, we do that today because we do communion after uh, the sermon today, but it's also we can anticipate the blessings of God, right? We don't have to wait. We, God has given us so much. And so in our giving today, whether through your Connect card and registering your attendance or your financial gifts, as the offering plates come around, um, feel free to drop those in. But you can also give online or drop things off during administrative office hours, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. But whether you've given today, you give to the kingdom, you give in so many ways, we recognize and appreciate your gifts.
Friends, together we return to another sermon related to our place in the world as stewards of God's creation. If you haven't picked up on it today from images all around us or in song, today we are focusing on water. Water is mentioned over 700 times in the Bible. It doesn't take long for it to get mentioned, does it? Genesis 1. The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of waters. It's such an essential component, it was created on the first day. Like last week, when we talk about creation, it is at the beginning and the end of the Bible. Revelation song was sung just a minute ago. Water is mentioned again near the end. Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say, come and let everyone who hears say, come and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. There are biblical reminders that the Bible has the power to heal. It can be seen in stories of 2 Kings, King Naaman, the annual miracles of Bethsaida in Jerusalem, in the Gospel of John. When we think of the hurricane this past week, we're reminded of the power of water, the possibility of destruction. The Bible tells of destructive powers of flood as well. Water has the power to provide deliverance and can destroy enemies, as in the story of the flight of Israel from Egypt in Exodus. One of the attributes of Jesus is Jesus as living water. He extends an invitation to all who thirst, and as we come in communion today, we remember his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. Jesus on the cross had blood and water poured from his wound while he was crucified. Water is everywhere, not only in the Bible, but across the earth. The blue planet, 70 to 75 percent of our surface is covered with water. But how about this? Our bodies, roughly 60% of an adult body is made up of water. That much of the adult brain is made of water as well. Water is everywhere and provides nourishment and recreation. Again, at least 700 verses in the Bible that I could pull from. I've already pulled from some. I'm going to read from... The Old Testament, three um, places from the Psalms. First, beginning with chapter 65, you visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. In Psalm 33, he gathers the water of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. A little introduction to Psalm 104. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships which you form to play in it. Those all look to you to give them their food in due season, and when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. For the gift of Scripture, thanks be to God. Now I want you to imagine with me for a moment your very favorite place of water. Perhaps it is a place that you have been for recreation. A family spring or well. 
It is a place that you go to often, once a season, or to return to daily. Consider that spring, waterfall, creek, river, lake, ocean, fount of water. How does it make you feel to be there? How does that water give you life? Is anyone with you? Because when I think about water and community, there's nothing more that I can think of than baptism. Because as much as water is important to our earth and to our bodies, it is a significant part of our faith experience. For those baptized, do you remember your baptism? I'm going to say those that were baptized this year in our confirmation class especially will remember the chilly waters. But even if you don't remember your baptism, what stands out about your baptism? If you weren't there, who made decisions for you? Who stood around the waters with and for you? How were you brought into community through your baptism? And what sense of community have you felt since your baptism? What do you encourage others in baptism? On this Sunday, when we talk about water and the gifts of creation and our place in it, we are reminded how we are blessed by water and what it means to us as a community. In baptism, we remember that we are renewed. Sins are washed away. We're given new life. In baptism, we remember God is always there. God claims us. We're brought into community through baptism. And baptism gives us a starting place, which is good news for today's lesson. We remember Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. Do you remember how John said, no, 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 I'm not worthy. Why, why do you need baptized? And Jesus found it proper to fulfill all righteousness that that he be baptized so that he could extend to us the gift of water and the spirit. And as we learn that Jesus needed to be baptized, at the same time we also hear Jesus' place as Lord of all creation. And yes, much of our conversation about Jesus will be focused on the crucified and risen Christ. We're also reminded of the cosmic Christ. We hear of it in Colossians 1, where Jesus has supremacy over all things. It says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the cosmic one who not only is before all things, he is the unifying impulse in all of creation. A little bit mind-stretching, isn't it? Christ is not only the one who brings healing and reconciliation between humans and gods, but between all creation and God. See, God's creation involves the entire natural world, the whole cosmos. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Romans 8, 18 we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. So, here today, we are reminded with the cosmic Christ that we are stretched to see more than our limited horizons or only what we know of creation. There is a new creation 
It's bigger than I can ever imagine. And if there was ever a week for that, it was this week. We bumped an asteroid 600 million miles from Earth, right? NASA, their Planetary Science Division director declared, this is a new era of humankind. But all I could think of was what a vast, magnificent universe we live in. Our Earth is but one among billions of planets in one small galaxy among galaxies. And if we think we're the first to think about this, here again, Psalm 8. O Lord, you're sovereign. How majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of, mortals that you care for them? And so we're reminded as, as Christ cares for us and as we're servants of Christ, we are called to work with the cosmic Christ in healing and alienated and broken creation. For all the times that people say the church isn't right now, or the church has lost its, its mark, its influence, we have opportunity when we think about creation care. Because one of our jobs as the church is to be a sign, a foretaste, an instrument of God's reconciliation in the world. So when we hear there's a water crisis, what are we supposed to do? Water crisis? I mean, our name's Springfield. <laughs> but yet, we know that water gets covered up in Springfield, don't we? And, and we're between the lakes and there's seemingly limitless water at our fingertips. But if we confess and are honest, we know the world has water problems. More than 750 million people around the world do not have reliable access to water. Fewer have access to water for agriculture and household tasks. Two billion people go without minimal sanitation. An estimated 250 million cases of waterborne illnesses arise each year. That's close to every person in the United States having a waterborne illness each year. So despite our cascade of free water, we are facing a future in which water may be hard to come by. Alex Joyner, a mentor of mine in a program that we have been involved in over the past couple of years, and a fellow United Methodist faith leader reminds us that as demands for fresh water grow with population, water scarcity then can contribute to economic and political instability. A number of factors contribute to water supply stresses beyond just population too, right? There are declining underwater aquifers as our water supply and glaciers shrink. We also acknowledge that our diet affects water because as more developing countries add meat to their diet, there is need for more water for livestock and grain to feed those animals. Poor water management also contributes to the problem. But if we think this is just far away, I bet we could also think of places where there were short supply of good water, people having to boil water. We can think of places where people were restricted from drinking water. One that I had not known of until Alex reminded me was the Kanawha Water Valley of West Virginia, home to 300,000 residents in the state capital of Charleston being there. They will never take fresh drinking water for granted again. 
In January of 2014, there was a chemical spill in the Elk River that poisoned their water supply and led to weeks of insecurity. Weeks where they said, water is only good for flushing your toilets. And that water crisis highlighted the precarious state of water quality and access in a contemporary world. If that's not enough, the United Nations estimates that by 2025, 1.8 billion people will live in areas of absolute water scarcity. What is the future for water security in a changing world? Is there, is there a part we play in this? In the end, changing the face of crisis, of course, involves education. It means talking about it. It means looking at the problem. It means overhauling forms of consumption. We have to address pollution if we're going to talk about water scarcity. How do we change our irrigation and agriculture practices? How are we going to price water appropriately in the world? I, I often feel extremely humble when I am presented with such information because I have as much to learn as the next person. But my place as a steward of creation calls me to gain a better understanding of holistic management of natural resources. When God calls all things good and then calls us to follow and be caretakers, it puts a burden on us, gives us more responsibility. Christ often focused on living faithfully acknowledging what God does provide, and then being compassionate and concerned about the poor. I think about Kingsway being leaders in the initial program for Mozambique and, and other areas and missions that, that we have taken or supplied resources for that people have filters and wells and clean drinking water but we're not done. Annette Andrews Lux asks us, what might it mean to care about the vitality of our rivers and soils and trees as if we cared for our own family? How do we break down the destructive barriers that stand not only between human beings, but also between the human species and the rest of creation? Who's gonna step out first? Who's gonna confess and say, I have a part in this Who's going to say, let us be the leaders in this? Yes, we will be challenged to the core. There are no easy, quick answers. We know it's going to cost sacrifice and trials and suffering. There is no clearly defined path forward. Just when I, I think about uh, the destruction of a hurricane, what do we do first? Um, do we... Do we offer um, aid um, or are we helping um, in, in other ways um, uh, of, of supplies and, and how do we move? It's, it's a complicated task when we think about um, the ways in which we're called to pray and act in the future. We must rely on the Spirit to lead us and, and when the Spirit speaks to obey. We must open our hearts to deep transformation. Because again, Thomas Berry, an echo theologian, says, we will go forward together as one sacred community, or we will perish together in the desert. The texts from this Sunday have called attention to the significance of water its healing properties, its renewal, its restoration, made possible by the life-giving water. It's in water that we've been nurtured in a womb. It's in water that we've been baptized and renewed. We are called to bring healing and renewal to the world 
as a mark of our identity as baptized servants of God. When we think that this is just something that we've thought up and are needlessly worrying about today, I think of John Wesley and the conditions of 18th century England where he called Methodist societies as signs of God's work in bringing creation into being. And I wonder today, as heirs of John Wesley, some 300 years later, could God be calling us to be signs of hope in this millennium? God is calling us to be a community in which all know their identity as beloved children of God, where barriers are removed and where justice enables the lowly to be exalted and the least to be welcomed with joy at the table in God's cosmic home. Amen. So Jesus' announcement of the coming near of the reign of God is followed by a life-altering invitation. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. It is an invitation to turn away from a world of sin towards a new world God is bringing near in Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to repent and be renewed at the Lord's table today. So I hope you hear that as an invitation. This is a table that Jesus sets for all of us. So as those who are helping with communion today would come forward here to the altar, I want all of you to hear that our tradition names this as an open table for all who seek to meet Jesus. It is our tradition that we carry communion to our children, that they are able to share in this time of response with us. And in a moment, you will be called forward to receive the elements. Reminder that they are gluten-free and available in a variety of ways. So as you come forward, there will be the bread and a chalice in the center, there will be a basket of individual cups for those who wish um, to receive the juice individually. But if you want, you can um, dip your bread in the communion cup and chalice. As always, after you receive, you may come to the altar and pray or return to your seats as you will.
Join us on our last song. This is called Raise a Hallelujah.
team of which she is a part. So it's not too often that I get to put Dr. Pepper up at the altar. But this is something Pastor Scott and I share in common, among other things, including being in ministry. And uh, we are happy today to share in something that is hard to celebrate. Um, but in our United Methodist tradition, we have a service for farewell of a pastor. And uh, this is a necessary thing because we are called um, at different seasons to be in different places. The Bonds family has been here for the past four years and serving in various ways as we have seen Scott move from a position specific to our youth to overall discipleship associate ministry for which I give great thanks. That transition also happened in the middle of COVID. Um, so to take that on and um, be among us, we give thanks. I thank you, the members of Friends of Kingsway United Methodist Church, for the love and support you have shown me while I have ministered among you. I am grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted, and I ask forgiveness for the mistakes I have made. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. I accept your gratitude and forgiveness, and I forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me, and I pray for you in your ongoing ministries. This is the place where I get to say whatever I want, and I've got a long list of things I've been waiting to say. Here we go. Point number one. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> Contrary. Contrary to uh, those that uh, know me, um, I can be a man of short words, a few words, except for when I'm preaching. Um, but I just, I would say this in uh, wrapping things up. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for all that you've done in support of me and of, uh, of caring for my family. You know, I leave here a different man than I came. 
Uh, and um, I hope to make a difference in the world and continue on the ministry and the mission that we have gathered together. Um, now, I will say this. Um, I will not tell you goodbye. Uh, I will leave it be at see you later, because uh, Lord willing, uh, I will be back visiting family, and we'll see you again soon. I look forward to that. Again, God, we call upon you to be with the Bonds family. We thank you for their love and care given to us as we offer them to a new place in your kingdom. Bless them. Remind them that you go ahead of them, come behind them, and reside with them at each place along the way. I invite you now to join me in this final prayer. Eternal God, whose steadfast love for us is from everlasting to everlasting, we give you thanks for cherished memories and commend one another into your care as we move in new directions. Keep us one in your love forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Now we move to a benediction. I'm going to take this with me because I'm thirsty. And, and contrary to belief, I also do share. So if uh, I'm not great at it, but I do do it occasionally. Uh, encourage if you're thirsty, come on and visit me in the, the, the place formerly called the chapel parlor. I, the room adjacent off. Come by, grab a cookie, say hi. Uh, but at the end of the day, we gather and worship, not about me, not about anybody that stands on this stage or altar, but to celebrate Jesus and his shared work in our life and in the world. And we pray that as you come, that you will have felt and experienced the good news, the love, grace, mercy of God. And that you've received it in such a way that as you leave from this place, that you were so marked and touched by it that you can't help but share it with your neighbor, whoever that is that you might come across. So wherever you find yourself today, your journeys might take you, I pray that you go knowing first and foremost and always that you are dearly loved by God and that you go in grace, mercy, and peace. Amen.